So if you found yourself in a pattern of choosing bad partners and having a really hard time finding a healthy relationship, this video is for you. If you come from a background of a dysfunctional family and a toxic family system, that tends to drive our relationships and that's usually the root cause of why our relationships don't really work out. I'm Patrick Tian, LICSW, Childhood Trauma Specialist and I work with adults who have been through childhood trauma and in much of my individual sessions and group sessions we spend a lot of time talking about how to find a healthy partner what to look for and what are the things that drive us to be attracted to people who might be toxic or unavailable or both those things um, in short I don't really think that anybody really knows how to date it's not in Western culture we don't really sort of I don't think we talk about it in family systems so there isn't really a blueprint about how to sort of date but I find that for people who come from dysfunctional family systems is it tends to be a little bit more messy well actually a lot more messy so if you have found yourself dating people and there tends to be some trauma bonding going on where you're deeply codependent with somebody and you both have sort of low standards and you kind of both take care of each other in a locked way that isn't really functional or healthy. Uh, or if you tend to date a certain type of person, whether they're sort of a narcissistic person, if you tend to date someone with addictive qualities, or even if you tend to date kind of like, you know, seemingly healthy people, like they look good on paper, but you miss major red flags and you end up in a place of kind of like really confused about how you got there and what did you miss. We're going to get into why that all happens and how to avoid it. So here's what we're going to cover in this video. We're going to cover three things. The first thing is what the pattern of unhealthy dating feels like and where it takes us. Number two, why we tend to date the wrong people. And number three, we're going to look at three healthy qualities to look for in a potential partner. So when we start dating somebody and we become smitten with them, we're enamored with them, we're really into them, trauma survivors tend to look at this person through tunnel vision and we don't see the potential mess that lies underneath. It's what this person has going on. This is very important because we tend to miss major red flags because we only look at the person's good qualities. So I know the video just started, but I gotta say that this is probably the most important thing that I want you guys to walk away with. Having tunnel vision is usually what gets you into trouble by not paying attention to what is really going on with the person because we so, we're so desperate to make something work and we're so into the person. So this is why it's important to really take our time and be thoughtful. You'll see what I mean in the steps later. And our tunnel vision is driven by our childhoods, our negative core beliefs, I recently did a video on that, and also our rush to be in a relationship. We usually want a relationship really fast. This leaves us making poor choices, and we get caught in a power struggle with the wrong person, and this leaves us more hopeless than when we started dating. So why do we tend to date the wrong people? Well, this is complicated. When we grow up in trauma and dysfunction, it leads to having unfinished business, which is essentially our issues. And that leads to trying to fix our childhood issues with our present partners, meaning that we try to get somebody to see us, to love us, to listen to us, and we also might spend a lot of time trying to get somebody to wake up for us. This leads to finding people that replicate our parents in some way we go with what is familiar, meaning if we are familiar with somebody shut down, we might be attracted to somebody who is shut down. We also tend to have a broken radar system. A healthy person has a working radar system that catches the red flags of dating and sees them up front. But when you grow up in trauma, you usually spend a lot of time not trusting your own perception, spending a lot of time second guessing yourself and second guessing other people, and to be honest, we often are poor judges of character. When we grow up with crazy, we have a hard time seeing it when it comes up, making the radar system broken. Trauma survivors tend to have an approach to dating where their stakes are too high and the bar is too low, meaning that out of desperation, loneliness, and not thinking we can do any better, we take a gamble on people. 
and our standards are too low that we usually end up frustrated and baffled why it doesn't work. And what all this means is we need to take a different approach where we need to be more discerning and we need to take our time and slow things down to make sure the person is a good fit. We also need to aim higher. So like the tunnel vision thing, the high stakes and low bar is super important where I think when you guys are on a date or when you start to dating someone or think back to your prior relationships, you probably knew you were either going too fast or making a bad choice in some way. Maybe not so much in the front of your mind, but somewhere in there, you might have known. And I want you guys to really pay attention to that part of you. That is your gut. Sometimes you trust your gut and sometimes you don't. But if you approach your dating life from a little bit of sort of desperation and impatience and having low standards, it's not going to work. You're not going to find that the partner that you want. So I want you guys to really take a step away from this and start doing things differently. Here are three qualities of healthy partners and what to watch out for when dating. Number one, low neuroticism. Neuroticism by definition means anxiety, worry, fear, anger, frustration, envy, jealousy, guilt, depressed mood, and loneliness. I'm gonna be throwing a lot of stuff at you guys right now, so this is a lot. So low neuroticism. The list on the left is more of what I call submissive neuroticism. The list on the right is more aggressive narcissism. Think about prior partners, pause the video, and go over this list and think about, did any prior partners exhibit some of these stuff? In essence, what we're looking for in our dating life to ask ourselves is the person that you're dating, are they an easy person or they're a difficult person? Everybody has stuff, but we want a minimal amount of stuff that is manageable. Number two, we want our potential partners to have a high ability of self-reflection. Is the person psych-minded? If you're watching this video, chances are that you're psych-minded and would you or the person you're dating, would they be into the video as well? Has the person been through some experiences? Have they been through some stuff and learned from it? Have they come out the other side of some bad relationships and grown? And lastly, are they on some kind of path of recovery? Are they in a 12-step program? Do they do therapy? Do they do meditation? Do they do anything? But beware, some people can talk a good game about being self-reflective, but do they walk the talk? Anybody can post like an inspirational meme, but that doesn't mean that they have a good high sense of self-reflection. In short, is the person you're dating, are they aware of what they do and why they do it? Number three, we want our partner to have a high ability to own their part. Think about your parents' ability to own their part and you'll see what I mean. Can the person you're dating, are they able to stay present during conflict and listen? Can they tolerate being wrong if that happens? Do they get that their behaviors affect others? And most importantly, do they actually change their behavior after discussions about it or bumps? In short, is this person compassionate and mature in a relationship? So those are the three qualities of looking for a healthy partner. And I want to challenge you guys, and maybe you're already thinking of this, is where do you lie in these three qualities? You know, if someone's dating you, do you kind of bring in too much neuroticism? Do you need to be working on that? Are you self-reflective? Do you sort of know um, why you do things or and how you do things? And do you have the ability to be able to own your part in conflict without being too defensive? It's not just about, you know, where our dating life can often fail is sort of what we bring into it as well. So it's important to sort of to sort of judge yourself against these three qualities. And if you don't really have that kind of going on, to be nobody's perfect, but to be working towards it. I think that working on a neuroticism is a huge step forward when it comes to stuff. So to recap, number one, low neuroticism. What that means is the person is really secure and confident. Number two, high self-reflection. What that means is the person has insight and is into personal growth in some way. Number three, they have a high ability to own their part, meaning that they're not driven by shame in their relationships.
So at this point, after looking at those three qualities, you guys are probably thinking, magical unicorn, it's never going to happen, this person isn't out there. And, you know, I know what you mean, and part of you is right. I'm not sort of saying that you need to find the person with these three qualities only. But what I am saying is, like, these three qualities is I want you to be thinking about these three things when you are on a date. You're going to meet a person who's not going to fit this bill, but I want you to be thinking about meeting a person that's different than your norm, that's different than your usual person that you might be attracted to or find yourself with. So I very much get that it's in, these standards are impossible, these three things, but it's not about that. It's looking at it in a good enough way because you could meet somebody who is like kind of highly neurotic, but they're really working on it or they're... They're neurotic in a way, but they really are able to own their part in things and be self-reflective. So it doesn't have to be perfect in any way. So I hope this video was helpful to you guys, and I wanted to end with an analogy that I give in my group, coming back to the dysfunctional family system. When I'm having this discussion in groups, sometimes I'll give a hypothetical about dating in our teenage years, which I think is when, you know, in Western culture, that's when sort of like, you know, young adults start to date and they go on their first dates and they have their first crushes and first falling in love. And children, even at that age, need a lot of help. The hypothetical that I give is that um, a teenager goes on a date with somebody and, you know, pizza, the movies, that kind of a thing. And then they come back, and that the premise of this hypothetical is that, that this is a healthy family system. The kid's coming from a healthy family system. So they go on their first date, and they come back, and they go to their mom, and the mom was like, how was the date? And the kid says, well, not really that great. They just really just talked about themselves the whole time, and they made me pay for half of my pizza, and um, it, it was just sort of kind of really awkward, and I just kind of wanted to kind of go home, and they were on their phone a lot. Um, and the, the parent rightfully will be like, whoa. And then, you know, and then the kid says, and, you know, then I agreed to go on another date with them. And then the parent is, there's the teaching moment, is when the parent sort of says, you know, like, well, honey, you know, it's like, it might not be a bad idea to, you, you have the right to change your mind. And, you know, do you know why maybe you said yes? And maybe the kid says something like, oh, we're just kind of on the spot and I didn't want to hurt their feelings. Um, do you see kind of what I'm getting at is that a healthy parent in that place would say, hey, you have the right to change your mind. And it's really important to date people that you kind of not only connect with, but you feel like they can kind of be sort of available and kind of interested in you. And they're not just kind of about themselves, you know. And I know the hypothetical is odd is maybe the kid that the, the, the their kid went on a date with was, was nervous. There's that quality too. But the lesson is is to be able to give our children choice, is to be able to give our children the ability to change their mind and take their time. But more importantly, is to allow our children to have the process of finding out who you like and to do that not from a shame place. Chances are in the toxic family system, this analogy is, well, first of all, it's kind of a moot analogy because most likely if you're growing up in trauma dysfunction, you don't talk to your parents about your dating life because it's probably not safe. You're either going to be neglected in it or criticized in it or something like that. But imagine um, in a toxic family system, the parent might just kind of say like, sort of like, well, you probably can't really do any better. I've had clients that parents literally say that about their their children and their, their problems and relationships. They say, might as well stay. You can't do any better. And that's coming right from the horse's mouth. So... That might have been a little bit rambly, but I hope you guys kind of get uh, my point there is kids need a lot of help. And this stuff, this stuff is hard for anybody. Dating is hard at any age, but it's, it's amazing when we are able to find somebody that we really connect with and we feel safe with and we have this like really great connection with. And I find that we can't really get to that person if we're approaching it from a place of having a broken heart. So hope the video is helpful, you guys. Subscribe, hit the little bell notification, ask questions, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.